All right, guys, it's right around seven o'clock. It's Thursday night. I'm sorry about a couple of nights ago, but we're in the clear. And man, I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite a while. I got Jody Jones with us tonight. How are you doing tonight, Jody? I'm good, Bernard. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being on here. Man, I am so, so happy that you're here with us tonight. And thank you for accommodating my schedule. And for those of you, I want you to look behind Jody. That's the SEC East. And you're going to notice there's a certain color that's not there by choice. Yeah. I applaud that. Yeah. I, yeah. I applaud that right here, buddy. Right here. Let's don't get started. That. Not around here, man. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, guys, if you don't know Jody, then you hadn't been following the Vanderbilt program for the last 40 plus years. Jody's second generation, Mama Lucy, Brother Dwayne. And Jody, the whole family, I mean, just throw all of them in there because they are as black and gold as any family that's been in forever supporting Vanderbilt athletics, not just football, but all the athletics. And uh, they're starting to roll in here for you. As you could imagine, uh, Brother Dwayne is with us. Uh, we got OJ Fleming. We got some others. It's too fast rolling through. Sorry, guys. And it, it, say hey to me on there so I know who's who's there, we can give uh, Jody a, a shout out. Jody, was there ever any doubt that you'd end up wearing the black and gold in college? No, no. I, I mean, I grew up over there. It wasn't, was it not, not that anybody was looking to recruit too heavily anyway, but there was no doubt. That's where I was going. I was home. Watson well, was uh, my dad's best friend. We grew up, you know, going to his games, wherever that was, Vanderbilt early on, uh, Cincy, Rice. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Then when he came home during your era and all that, but yeah, grew up over there. Uh, first meeting, probably Doc Crease was my first recollection of, of Vandy. Mm -hmm. Seven or eight strolling around going over there in the summers and McGugan was a different layout than it is now. You know, it had racquetball and mm -hmm. uh, basketball courts and strolled into Doc's weight room by, you know, just by chance and 300 pound man start screaming at me that this is not a bleeping daycare <laughs> rather than uh throw me out comes over and grabs me and starts showing me exercises and from that time forward it was uh every summer with, with doc and uh you know every accolade that you got doc would call you he was very very supportive make no mistake about it my guest tonight was a tackling machine at donaldson christian may still hold the records over there do you uh -huh. I still got one, and my son's uh, best friend is the uh, current linebacker. So I, I give him a lot of grief about that, and uh, mm -hmm. th that I'm still there, there on top. But my my coach is still the athletic director, so I doubt anybody will get too far out, out of hand. But the great thing <laughs> about tackling record at the school, uh, Bernard, was that when I was there, the the local paper used to put out the Tennessee and Nashville banner. You guys remember? I tackling leaders for high school every week. And I kept telling my coach, it's like, man, this Shelton Quarles guy is first and he's beating me. And I was averaging 17, 18 tackles a night. He's averaging 20, 22 tackles. I said, they got to be padding his stats. So when I got to Vandy, my high school coach called out the first week or so. And he was like, what about the Quarles kid? Uh, you think, uh, you still think? I said, nah, man, they cheated that guy on several tackles. He should have been way ahead in that poll compared to everybody else. <laughs> I was going to say, he turned out to be a pretty good prospect, didn't he? Yeah, he was, Shelton was legit as they could get. He was. And speaking of legit, Joe Peebles is in the house. Billy Smith and Coach Gary Shepard all say to tell you hello. The Keystone. That's right. Oh, Joe yep. P. Joe, I need to get you on this show, buddy. We need to, we need to talk. Uh, just as a side note, if you guys will get into the Facebook group, you see I've been able to secure. We got guests all the way up until Hawaii game week. So we got Tuesday nights covered for this whole summer. So I hope you guys keep coming back on Tuesdays. Jody, one of your first memories I know is, is hanging out and just walking around as a little kid and throwing footballs and maybe at practices or at, at games. But – there's a long way from being a six, seven, eight, nine year old, 10 year old boy on the sidelines watching the current version of the Commodores each of those years and just dreaming that that's going to be me one day. But then it became reality for you. You know, you, you developed into that athlete. Watson didn't just hand you a scholarship. Let's be honest, there, there's only so many SEC scholarships are around each year. You clearly showed athleticism and a need. So here, here's my question. At what point 
in reality for you? At what point did it dawn on you that you had the skill set and that this was going to be a thing for you to play on the next level? You know, we grew up over there, like I said, playing ball boys. But when you look back at the kids that were ball boy and it was just instilled, you had Jeff brothers. Jeff mm -hmm. ended up playing. Jeff and Jody brothers, they were out there uh, early on, Mike and Matt McIntyre. And, you know, Mike ended up playing at Vandy for a while. And then I think G Tech and then it's now coaching out at FIU. Uh, so it, it was instilled on a lot of them. And Watson did get a little lucky on me, me Bernard. We're not lucky, but I, I was lucky, I guess I should say, because mom was in that program where she'd been there so long. They didn't have to count me, and Vanderbilt paid for my education. So I never had to count against the scholarship count at Vandy. Well, I was, I was going to say, I know that with your mama being a longtime employee, and, and gosh, it's a great it, benefit. Between June Jakes, Beverly Brothers, Lucy Jones, during my time period, and, and those those three stalwarts in the athletics department were there for three decades each, uh, at, at least. Those, those women became the de facto mamas for so many of us over the years. We were so very fortunate to have such three caring, loving, and attentive women in such key positions within the athletics department. It, it, I can't tell you how many families, my family included, were just so thankful that those mamas were there to look over all of us. Yeah, I mean, mom loved cooking for everybody that was there, having them out to the house. JJ and Bev were, you know, they were always whatever you needed to, to get help, like you said, family-wise. It was help getting the paper typed or printed or typed back in the day. But, uh, yeah, they, they were always part of it. When you think of Vanderbilt football, those are three ladies you think about along with, you know, Luke and uh, Eric and equipment guys, Keystone guys. They were, that was what made the place special to me uh, growing up around them. It did. And there's one woman who I don't want to leave out. In fact, if you go into the front lobby at Magoogan, there is a large portrait and a placard to Mrs. Rolf. Billy Rolf's mom, Margaret, was also in, I'm not sure what department she was in, but Billy, that first summer I was there in the, in the summer of 86, Billy took me into his home because I was there. I was just an 18 year old, scared, you know, homesick, all of that. But Billy had been there a while, took me in and his mom made me many, many home cooked dinners during that first summer. So I don't want to leave out Mrs. Rolf as well. Yeah. And Miss Stroop was in the back. Uh, Miss Cloy, she got us all our our money monthly and all that stuff. So there, there was a lot of good people, Miss Detheridge in basketball. So a lot of, a lot of ladies grew up around there that uh, were, were key, key in helping you love Andy. You know, I was going to say for, for families who are fans of any sports program, any college program, and they don't have children in the system or a relative who works in there, I don't think they really understand how the family atmosphere can exist on, on those levels. If you really think about McGugan, and how it's evolved over the years and which uh, sports were housed there and, and so forth. There were literally hundreds of people in and out of that building every single day. And there have been for decades and decades. And the people who work there and the kids who come through there, whether they're there for a year or six years or however long that they're there, it really does feed into a family atmosphere. It, it really does. And I, I've always appreciated that. And I know you and Dwayne and, and just your family being, I'll call you an insider, just because mama working there for so long. That had to have been incredible for how many younger and older brothers that the two of you guys had for so, and even now, probably lifelong friends. Yeah, Dwayne, Dwayne's always been, you know, my best friend and had my back and same thing with him. And he grew up over there as well with, you know, Luke and Bill in the equipment room since we were kids and Chris and Brad went to high school with him and he ended up going to college with both of them. So a lot of lifelong friends and, and Luke's still been, he and Julia are, are part of our family. Every Friday night, we see them at uh, high school games and just, uh, you know, Luke was one of those pieces too over there that, you know, yeah, you'd feel at home. Didn't matter if you were the starter or last kid on the team. He was, uh, and I, I can't, you know, with Dwayne and Tyler, and I, I could go on and on. All the 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 the, the student assistants. Yeah, they they were they were great to be around, and they were fun and and so knowledgeable. I can't say that about their boss. He wasn't that warm and fuzzy type. And of course, guys, we're talking about Bill Kelly. 
Bill was the, the dean of the equipment room for decades. He was in, on the national boards. He was known throughout the country. And the little amount of budget that he was given each year, he worked wonders. Now, granted, you wore the same grays forever. They may or may not have been fully washed or dried. You may have worn uh, somebody else's hand-me-down cleats and those kind of things, but that was back in the day. But he or could, maybe even their jock if he wasn't careful and uh, made him mad about them. <laughs> that's exactly it. Never one to be petty or hold grudges. But no, I love Kelly. We all do. He was unique. Luke and Dwayne and those guys had so such fun. And it was extremely hard work if you didn't know what those guys did. We all, as athletes, we went home. We had our own schedule. They were there for hours before, hours after. They worked as many hours, if not more, than we we ever did. Yeah, absolutely. Luke was there from, I mean, no, toward the end before he retired, he, he was there at four in the morning. I'm like, Luke, yeah. four in the morning. He's, he's just been, you know, special. He, he's probably the one guy that connects everybody for generations over there. Oh my gosh. One and guy he knows, go, hey, what about this year? And Luke's going to know him. Yeah. Oh my gosh. He's the mayor. But I want to, I want to step back a little bit. I want to talk about the Gaines family. The probably the most athletic family who I, I know of having four or five boys go through college and most play professional ball. But the Jones family and the Gaines family have been decades long family friends. And I, I played with Brad who came into my class of 86. Chris was already there in all America. And as I've said many times, I got to witness the greatest defensive game I've ever seen. In 87, he had 37 tackles at Tulane. I doubt it's ever been accomplished since. It's probably an SEC record, maybe a national ranked record. But Chris could cover sideline to sideline, but off the field, he was the nicest dude in the world. Talk a little bit about the relationship of the Jones family and the Gaines families. Yeah, the Gaines is uh, our special, the whole family. This year, we really got have some special times. Uh, Brad's son, Bradford, was the quarterback at our high school team, uh, and my son was the tailback. So. We had a lot of fun uh, tailgating. Brad and Chris there every Friday night with their families. Uh, just a lot of good fun. And ended up winning the state championship. So I don't know how Bradford goes out on top. Did a great job leading. But uh, yeah, just give you some great stories on them. Worked out with them every summer. Um, two of the funniest, hardworking guys you'll ever meet. But it was like we trained, lift in the mornings, and then a little conditioning of some sort and then lunch it was kind of let loose and have fun and i'll never forget being at our house and having a bb gun and chris was like brad let's have a tough man contest he's like tough man contest he's like yeah this thing pumps we'll go up to one of us quits won't take enough pumps so they started with like five chris shoots brad first you know hollering jumping around chris turns around rather than five pumps brad's at about eight when chris turns around and hits him breaks the skin he's screaming and y'all all know chris's voice and all that but hollering jumping around i mean they were just so much fun and then uh when i was probably a junior high brad was probably still at dupont and chris was maybe freshman sophomore year at vandy uh mr hudgens got us in this thing on the ralph emory show it used to be the outhouse race at opry land theme parks parking lot so it's me and chris brad and chris hudgens pushing against uh i remember one team was mayo tire and it was carl jordan and marvin thomas and all these huge huge guys and of course chris and brad are they're competitive people it wasn't any losing even at an outhouse race so we go into turn one and there's a guy sitting actually on the the john with no door on it that you pulled around the, this just you know regular racetrack corner one chris you know goes into we, we didn't know what happened at the time. Went home, ate breakfast after the VHS to, to replay it. But he falls, and as he's falling, he's holding the rope, and the outhouse is flipping over, and the guy's jumping out of it. And all the way home, you know, Chris is, is mad that we lost and trying to analyze what happened. And then we get home and, and see that going turn one, Brad wasn't turning. And so Brad forearmed Chris and kind of knocked Chris down, and Chris ended up flipping the outhouse over. So if we could ever find the video of that from the Ralph Emery show. It would be something. It was hilarious. And that would be golden. 
that would be some good stuff right there. Guys, and you know how hard they work, though. I mean, the fun stuff was there, but they, they train, man. They that's uh their mindset. What my my son now I, I try to explain to him, he's like, if I have to hear another Chris Brad story about how hard trained, da, 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 I was like, it was it was all day. It didn't it didn't end two hour lift, it's it was all day. Yeah, and that that's what I guess that's part of the key of their success on, on and off the field. Guys, I'm talking with Jody Jones. Jody was played at Vanderbilt a few years after me. I, I graduated in 90. Jody, you came in what year? I was at the end of 90, 91 when uh, Watson was going out and uh, Jerry was coming in and uh, had, had a good group too. But I mean, there, there were some great athletes on that team as well. I mean, oh, sure. There sure, there sure were. But I, I have to ask two things. I always have to ask if you have any good, bad, or indifferent memories about Bell Buckle. Got to start there. Yeah, Bell Buckle was uh, <laughs> not anything any of us looked forward to. So uh, having the T-shirt is about the only thing that, that – mm. we actually played the web school this year. My son's uh, high school did – or last year played up there. So – Place definitely does not look the same, and you know there was some some bad memories. And I was ready to get a win and get out of there that Friday night. We were up there just because you're you're ready to get out of there. Even though it's been about 25, 30 years, you still got a little PTSD built in there. Yeah, you, you still just didn't want to look around too much. It was time to get in the car and get back out of there. The other thing I want to ask you it's it's always tough when you come in and are recruited by one coach, and then a new staff and a new regime comes in while you're still there and unlike today with the free agency is what i call it in college sports where you can just leave because you don't like the grilled cheese sandwiches served in the gross i mean in the cafeteria you really were kind of locked in back in the 80s and 90s and all that like here's my, my question for you jody we, we know that Watson and Donardo were vastly different personalities, vastly different approaches to the team. How did Donardo act toward your classes, the Watson Brown recruited classes versus the guys he brought in with his regime? You know, I think a lot of times they new regimes, whether it was Coach Donardo or who, whoever it is, I, I think when they come in, a lot of times the big mistake they'll make is putting, you know, talk about the times of what was going on. Like there, there wasn't hard work going on. Well, there, there was a lot of hard work going on. There wasn't uh, the wins everybody would have liked, but, you know, just was tough because Coach Christophel, uh, mm -hmm. you know, those guys, Coach Shep, I, not only were they there with Watson, but like I said, we were, they were family friends in Cincinnati Rice and all yeah. that. So when they came home, you know, expectations were, we're big that it was going to happen through your era and all that. And we really all hoped it was. So it was, it was just tough. It was one of those deals where, you know, going to do it their way. Uh, kids that were under Watson, you know, tried, jumped on board. I mean, you had a, a upper class of bro then and uh, Steve Meads and uh, doc and DP Corey Harris. I mean, it, there was a lot of talent in that group. Uh, Getting getting to run the eye bone. I'm sure none of them signed up thinking they were going to get to run the eye bone. So. Yeah, that was a big a big difference. But you just mentioned a couple of roommates, and you left out Craycraft, Bobby and Craig. I have, and I have to ask about a pretty infamous story now that involves you and what I like to call the note rope, note ropes, no shoulders boys, snakes. You got to tell the story about the snake. Yeah, so. Brother and I shared a room and then uh, Harlow was originally in there and I took Harlow's place when he, he moved out uh, and then Meads and Bobby shared a room. Kevin was into animals and having things. And so he's got this Python snake and uh, none of us, Bobby and I could care less and didn't want anything to do and was about half terrified of it in the first place. And uh, so we come home one night after practice, you didn't have time for an animal, first of all, but you know, you come home and uh, the snake's not in the cage. So immediately Craycraft and I start packing our bag. We're, we're headed to my parents' house about 40 minutes out because we're not waking up with a bow constrictor bow tie in the morning. And no more than probably got down the road a little bit, uh, checked back in with Kevin after we ate dinner and he had found it. The snake had gotten out and wrapped up around the coils of the refrigerator back behind it. So we were able to go back home after Kevin, Kevin had it, but yeah, we were, 
nobody was sleeping at night with it. That, that uh, no, no, thank you. No, no thank, you. thank you. There was a, a player several years older than me, Mills Fleming. Yeah, I remember. I, I don't know if you remember Mills. I do. Was an offensive lineman. I think he was from Georgia. Dwayne will remember this story. And one of my prior guests, and I'm drawing a blank, but one of Mills' friends tells the story. Maybe it was Luke. Mills had a, a some type of a, a python, and it got loose over either Christmas break or spring break. And why they didn't take it with them, I don't know. But I want to say it got into the bowels of Carmichael Towers, like down in the, the tunnel area. It was a big fiasco at the time. But uh, Dwayne, if you remember any any bits of this, let me, anyway, I would no more have lived in that room with Brothen and that. Oh man, more power to you. Um, <laughs> and Kevin didn't know me that well. I mean, I remember our first night sharing the room together. Meads was kind of my friend because, like I told you, I've been ball boy going up, and uh, Steve was wearing the you know tie dye bandana, and I, I'd imagine getting to go. Andy, that, that was the next step. You get to play, play and wear a bandana and do all this stuff. And that wasn't happening when uh, Jerry got there, but, uh, but introduced me to Kevin and said my situation with being who mom was and all that, I was able to live off campus mm -hmm. first two years. So mm -hmm. it was an advantage and excuse me, all my roommates are seniors as I'm in my first two years. And that was, uh, that was, it was good, but, uh, but it was interesting, and, and Kevin's going to be on the show in a couple of weeks. I'm looking uh, yeah, he, he and I talk at least once or twice a week, so oh, we're that's still, great. Still very close, and brothers was a roommate my junior senior year, and Bill McDermott and that whole group. Oh, that's that's oh, you're bringing back some good names, guys. I'm talking with Jody Jones, of course. Jody, I want to talk about the academic transition coming from DCA to Vanderbilt. Was that, was it much of a transition for you or did you have some, some adjustments? Oh yeah. yeah there, there was a Shelton not only was kind of the guy in front of me that, that looked up to and all that. Once we got there, he was also my guidance counselor. Uh, Cause he'd either, he knew every class, what the attendance policy was and, and everything else that went along with it. So I'd always stop with Shelton to, to get into it. And as far as getting into school, one of your earlier guests, who's, you know, uh, some, somebody we all love if you're around, uh, Peabody, especially as Miss Neely, uh, oh. without Miss Neely, I would have never gotten in school. I, I sent her, called her probably seven, eight years ago, just thanking her, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because what there was a lot of us probably wouldn't have got in if it wasn't been for, uh, Miss well, Neely. I was going to say, I, I so enjoyed my conversation with her. I knew most of her story from a standpoint of, of her ability to work with the athletes and not to, to diverge into to this topic, but she was a rarity in the faculty standpoint, at least during my tenure and probably many other tenures times that athletics hadn't been a priority for decades at Vanderbilt. Yeah. We're seeing a little bit of a shift. Well, I should say a big shift now because it's coming from the administration, all the money, the infrastructure, what A.D. Candace Lee is doing, what Deermeyer is doing, and et cetera. I think it's wonderful and about way overdue. But with Dr. Neely, with Derek Gregg, what he did from an academics standpoint and, the, and what they have in place during your time and now up to now, I just think is, is fantastic support for student athletes. Regardless of your sport, you need some help along the way. Everybody does. I'll tell you another one of those guys that, that your generation a little further back will remember uh, was uh, Coach Martin. Coach Martin was one of those guys, Peabody, you could go back to, and Coach Martin was going to help you do whatever he could do to, to make life easier for you. If it was just somebody to have a chat with, Ed, Ed was top shelf. He was a good man. Oh, such such beautiful, beautiful people just giving back to to the student athletes. And they they it, it was kind of a mutual thing because – we all needed those mentors. We all needed those adult figures who have been there and done that. And they enjoyed that mentoring role and just guiding folks through because not everybody who comes to Vanderbilt to be a student athlete is going to matriculate and, and graduate. I don't know what the percentages are, but every recruiting class loses kids along the way. Uh, Chris Twist, uh, I mean, I could name four or five out of my year and other years. Chris was an awesome football player. He only stayed about six weeks. He, he athletically he could cut it, 
academically, he wanted nothing to do with Vanderbilt. And I'm not just picking on Chris. He's just one I remember. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure your class, I'm sure every class has those guys. For sure. I remember there was a guy named Andy Isenda that was there before me. And oh, Andy, yeah. Andy was a year behind me. Andy Virtually. left. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm pretty well equipped in high school with my brother being in the equipment room and, and yeah. Luke, you know, being family friends. So couldn't Luke couldn't give me any shoulder pads or anything like that. But Andy brought his own from, from high school and there were those Donsies and he left them. Well, they ended up being the pair that I finished high school with. So oh, Andy, wherever awesome. he is, thank you. Uh, still separated my shoulder my senior year, but it, it was, uh, I was well protected for a while. Oh, that's, that's great. That's great. Jody, let's talk about. One of the things that you, the Jones family and the Gaines family, and I keep coming back to you guys because you, you lived so close to the campus. Vanderbilt has student athletes from all over the country. There were kids from California, kids from South Florida, New York, wherever. And your family and the Gaines family would constantly bring in guys home for home cooked meals, just to get away from campus, just to kind of hang out. And I think that is so important because back in the day, we didn't have those time constraints on a weekly, hourly basis that they later put into place. Talk to us a little bit about some of the downtime. Where would you guys go? Did you go to the lake? Did you go? Where, what did y'all do? Because well, I know yeah. that it could be Easter holidays. It could be Thanksgiving. It could be any time. Well, my mom was always cooking for everybody, whether they're a basketball player football player you know whatever sport it didn't matter uh and that continued on even way after Dwayne and I were gone I had interns uh Shane Foster and Alex Gordon worked for us and mom kept them fed and uh but being from Nashville one of the things we would do is would got guys connected to different things even summer jobs because you know they always wouldn't pay for everybody to stay so there were times that uh we'd get summer jobs and I'd try to help them uh, one was was Starwood uh, amphitheater back in the day, a lot of the guys that played Kevin and Harlow and a lot of guys, David Neal all worked out at Starwood and then, um, club mayor bulls there wasn't many, I'm coming to Nashville now, if, if, you know, these guys that aren't around here, it, there's definitely a lot of different places to go. But back then there was, there was two places you went yeah. and, uh, mayor bulls was one of them down in the club. And Dwayne and I ended up working there for, for several years, even after Vanderbilt, uh, and, and forge some, some great friendships and relationships with being connected to Nashville. That was one nice thing for teammates and stuff to connect them to other people around town was, was good. And now I'm so thankful that the black and gold club has been put into place and Chris Griffin's doing a beautiful job spearheading it for all varsity sports to hook, hook up the athletes with former Vanderbilt athletes in a potential job uh, placements, um, internships, just networking. So I hope they continue to build that out. And Chris does a, a great job with that. You know, and coach, uh, not, not to totally down on Donardo, he, Jerry did try to implement something similar to that. When you came in your freshman year, you had a mentor that was a former player or family or something that you could call and go have dinner with. So it was definitely a good start, similar to, similar to what they're doing now. Well, that, that is great to hear. And now it's, it's you and I and, and Dwayne and everybody could have a, a completely separate call about what modern collegiate sports look like. I mean, heck, every, our conversation today could be a different one next week. It's almost free agency. It's almost, I mean, you, you see the, the support, supposed $8 million deal for the California quarterback coming to the, the orange team. I saw a thing where Alabama's quarterbacks were 3.1 million in NIO. Anyway, my point is, back in our day, we would get coupons for the weekend to eat at Gaddy's or Fuddruckers or Tony Roma's, and you'd get a little bit of cash to make up for the meal that you didn't get to eat on campus because, and this, I predated Magic in the, the, the training uh, facility at, at McGugan. We had to eat in the regular cafeterias on campus. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that. Magic did change the tone over there for quite a while. But mm -hmm. even at that, you, you can't eat in there every day. It, it, you got to have a little variety for these guys. So yeah. it, it's good to see. But, you know, I, I like I've told uh, Coach Lee before, the thing I got to appreciate these guys is all that sounds great. And to me, a lot of those guys are probably elite athletes. 
that are at that NFL level going in four and five star kids. And it's not really the kid that we're truly recruiting. I mean, to, to leave here, even for, I know he was telling me that a kid that transferred for, you know, an NIL deal at another school, but I mean, the degree to leave that behind, it's like, go through and look at some of the guys that are on, on this thing and how successful they've been coming out of Vanderbilt. Cause I know uh, for a fact, Derek Payne and I would not have gotten in dental school uh, had it not been for that degree. So, uh, you know, it, it matters no matter what these people say. It, it does matter. And, but the, the modern athlete, and we'll get off this in just a second, the modern athlete unless they truly have some wise advice that's in their ear and they're listening to it. Right now, it's too easy in this Instagram world. And it's the, the goldfish, um, not mentality, but it's the goldfish attention span, like two seconds. Anyway, I'm going to put that aside because we could definitely go down a road uh, talking about that but Jody I got some names to throw at you who've come on board Tyler Unzicker is with us big T some guy named David Crop. I'm not real familiar uh, he's with another him. one his family's just as tied in as Dwayne and I so the Crop family was definitely and and coach Crop and, and David are going to come on the show later oh, this good. summer so I'm looking forward to that uh let's see Crop. oh <laughs> Crop wants to know what did Jody and Dwayne, do you agree upon? What was Lucy's best dinner dish and who got the biggest serving? Oh man, David, you well, got depending on what time it was. Food. If it was football season, I probably did it. If it was time for report cards or something, Dwayne definitely did because his grades were way better. <laughs> I'd have patience today. Ask me, well, tell me about the difference between you and your brother. I said, well, my brother was president of his class. I was president of the fraternity of dental school. So that ought to tell you separate where <laughs> we're at. But Dwayne, my brother's one of the smartest men you'll meet. I mean, smart guy. Uh, and by the way, Dwayne says pot roast with about 10 vegetables gets his, his vote. And I'll give him a double thumbs up on that one. So I'm with him. Oh, Joe P, West End Cooker. I totally forgot about the West End Cooker. How can you well, forget chicken that? Fried chicken right there, Joe P. We, we all had a good, good dish of that. That's right. And I need to bring up the Magic and Brothen story. Is that a story you can share? As a statue? Uh, I think the Statue of Limitations have run out yeah. on it, so I think we're good. So, as you know, toward the end there, when you get your money, you had to decide whether you were eating on campus, especially Kevin and Steve and Bobby. They were at the end. And Bobby's dad owned a grocery store, so our apartment was mm – -hmm. we'd have cases of soda and things probably shouldn't have, but, I mean, it was loaded with groceries. But toward the end there, you know, Bob's finishing up and – wasn't as much going on. So Kevin's like, let's, let's go in the training room and grab a couple of frozen items to take back to the apartment. Of course, the training room's closed. Mm -hmm. We helped ourselves on in, walked in, we're grabbing a couple of things out of the fridge, take back to the apartment and magic walks in. And I said, well, we're done. I'm out of school. We're both gone. You guys are, you know, you already probably pretty much got your degree. I'm, I'm year one. So we're history. Magic looks at us and ends up cooking this, uh, steaks and gave us stuff to take home to make sure we were loaded up for sound and my wife often looks on my list of patients sometimes and be like why are you treating this person for free i'm like there's some statues that you just have to always keep filling back up because uh they took care of you when, it, when it, there was nothing so don't forget those kind no you you don't and you, you don't you know jody the reason why I started this series of conversations with Commodores is to hear stories like this. And it's, we know about the wins and losses. We know about the statistics, but it's the stories behind the stories. And every story you've told tonight brings a smile to your face. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what this is about. That's what this brotherhood is about. That's what these memories are supposed to, to invoke. How important Absolutely. for your time, how important in your lifetime, how has it shaped you as a man, your time at Vanderbilt? Oh, for sure. I mean, it's, it's lifelong friendships. Uh, Jeff brothers, one of my roommates, uh, still my son was in sixth grade. I sent Ashton over to Jeff and was like, Jeff, make him a quarterback. Cause he's a quarterback. We both know that you can play anything. If you're a quarterback he called me the first night, he's like, 
Jody, he's not a quarterback, but it was quarterback receiver camp. So day two, I said, well, is he a slot receiver? He's like, he can catch a ball, but he's not a slot receiver. And he said, he's a running back. I'm like, Jeff, he's not a running back. I said, so you're teaching me to tell him, go ahead and start backpedaling. He go out far how to be a DB. And so we ended up playing, ironically, Jeff in the state championship this year uh, for it. And, and Ashton had a good game. And afterwards, Jeff reminded me that he's the one that told me that he was running back, had, had a good day. So uh, – mm-hmm. But just those relationships, like with the brothers, um, Jeff and Jody going to school, um, you know, guys that are generations ahead of me, uh, Jeff Madden, I, I call Jeff all the time for advice and training with uh, Ashton. Carl Jordan talked to him the other day about his, mm-hmm. his input on some stuff uh, that's going on with him. And it's just friendships that you have forever. There's wins and losses. Sure, we all wanted more, but at the end of the day, I mean, this and this network is, is what it's about. It's just a like I sent you in the, in the notes and you would agree. It's just, a, it was a good group of people. You didn't have to worry about anybody that was around us. They were, they were all good kids and they've grown up to be good men. So. And, and that's what I love about this group. That's what I love about what the black and gold club is doing. That's what I love about what the, it, the, 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 the uh, athletics department brought back the pioneers back in February and had a phenomenal a uh, group of men get together in February to recognize their roles. And we need more of this. We need this to continue on. We need to continue building that momentum. And one of the things that I, Jody, that I noticed in the new plans for what they're building out is they're going to have space for the former athletes, whatever your sports, you're going to have places that you're recognized. And I, I truly think that that is, that's one of the key things to any successful program. I, I want to transition away from your Vanderbilt years. How did, how did you and Dwayne, Dwayne's already told his story, but how did you and Dwayne decide that dentistry was going to be your path? And take us a little bit on that journey. Yeah, so uh, Dr. McPherson, Dr. Mack, he was the team dentist for Vanderbilt and the staff over there for years. He and his wife, Colleen, were dear friends of my family. Um, you know, mom and dad, I don't think we ever paid for any dentistry nor did anybody in the building for many, many years. Dr. Mack was top shelf, uh, was the team dentist of the Predators, the Titans, you name a country singer or an entertainer, Dr. Mack was their dentist. I mean, he was the dentist dentist back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought you just, you know, make a phone call to get in dental school was what you did. And I, I had got the valedictorian in my high school didn't get in. Dr. Mack made one phone call on a Tuesday and I was accepted that Friday. And I think same thing kind of happened for Derek Payne. Uh, mm-hmm. Just having those kind of people to mentor you, let us come out to the office, see if it was something, you know, we liked. Um, and I'm looking at this guy doing easy stuff, taking, taking deposits, going to get the car wash, doing whatever. And, I kept looking at the deposit. I'm like, man, this guy works four days a week and he, he's kind of knocking it out. So mm-hmm. when we got up to school, they were giving this class and, and the main income was, was less than a hundred thousand dollars, a very general dentist. So I called Dr. Mack. I'm like, Hey man, you have lied to me. Th- these guys aren't making him any money. And he said, well, I didn't tell you that we were in the top one percentile in the country in our practice that, uh, he passed away about 17, 18 years ago. And, and when he passed away, they, they said they'd need three dentists in his practice to, to recoup the numbers that where he had it. So he was, he was a machine even, even back in those days. So the one I had a great mentor, uh, as Derek did any, any kid in the area that was trying to get in, Dr. Mack would bend over backwards to, to help him. You know, Jody, it, it truly, it's so true. Yes. Your numbers, your scores and what you did in, in school are very important, but I think that only tells part of the story, the desire, the, the, the want to, the, the interest, I think, is also so important. And the, the third leg of this, if you will, is that work ethic. And if, if you've got that mentality that nobody's going to outwork me, I may not be as smart, I may not be as fast or as strong in, in sports, but that's one thing you can't control, the others can't control, you can control, is that work ethic. And I know that that's been instilled in, in the Jones boys for many years. Yeah. I mean, that, that was Chris and Brad. It was working out at first and second tier is just, you know, and what that sport does to you makes, makes you mentally tough. Cause there was, there were things in dental school that, you know, you didn't, 
you're six figures in debt. You don't know if you're, you're getting out of this thing or if you're just walking away. Same thing with law school. I mean, you yeah. didn't know, Hey, I don't, I don't pass this, this final or this, uh, you know, exam, it, it could be over this state board mm -hmm. for whatever profession, medical, dental law, whatever it is, but you know, it, it mentally you're tough enough to battle, do whatever you got to do to get through. Well, let's Jody, we're, we're getting, let's see, we're getting close to the, toward our last segment here. And I appreciate your, your time so far. I want to talk about, and this is why I've had six different people talk about the WWE, talk about the country music stars. I don't want you to name names, but I want you to name names and tell us how fun has that been? I realize some people don't care about all of the, the celebs that get treated and the pictures on the wall. Others eat that stuff up. How did you even get into that realm, that world of treating the pro wrestlers? We'll start there. How did you get into that world? Yeah, so one of those pictures that's posted is of uh, me and Mark Calloway. Mark's the undertaker and mm -hmm. a guy named Jim Dotson. Jim was the head of security down at Club Mayor Bulls that I talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. Jim and Mark were, were close friends, um, introduced us, got to know Mark. Before, it really, he was, he was about a year away from breaking in to uh, who he ended up being for the next three decades. Uh, got to be good friends with them. Dwayne and I continued to commute back and forth during dental school, back to the club and work for Jim. And then uh, I graduated and we, of course, Mark had become a good friend uh, through those years while we were in school. And uh, as Dwayne and I were commuting back and forth, uh, Jim ended up, the, the club closed after nine years and uh, Jim ended up being named the head of security for the WWE that of course, Mark, uh, you know, he's the, the godfather of the business and what he says is going to happen. Uh, and so he'd asked Jim and he about went to Vince and I'd called Mark said, my brother's graduate next year. I bought a practice. We're going to end up building a new facility, make it big enough for both of us. But currently it's not. So you got anything I could do on the payroll to maybe just, you know, I'm thinking at the time it's going to be a lot of fun too, which it absolutely was. It was a vacation for me every Monday and Tuesday while Dwayne was stuck here holding the ship down. So my schedule was Sunday nights, I would fly out of Nashville to whatever city. And let's say we went to Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. we would uh, do Austin for some, or raw Monday night. Uh, as soon as we got into town, we're at the building by three, do that. Uh, pretty much job was, supposedly I was a medical dental. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I did anything medical or dental, maybe stitch one or two people and maybe re-cemented a crown here or there, but more or less helping Jim and, uh, you know, Mark being who he is, it, it's hard for him to travel or to get in and out of hotels. So mm -hmm. a lot of times it was stashing cars or dropping him off parking garages to get him up. And, uh, but really helping, helping Mark at first. And then, uh, this is kind of in the attitude era when it's really starting to explode and you got, mm -hmm. uh, Stone Cold and uh, Dwayne Johnson and, and all those guys uh, exploding. So Mark, about six months in, has an injury where they take him off the road for about six months. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm done now. We're out of the job. And uh, mm -hmm. he said, uh, no, Jim, Jim's going to go with Steve and you're going to go with uh, The Rock and ride with him. So we would, like I was saying, we'd fly into Austin. When Austin's show was over Monday night, we'd end up driving to, say, Houston, a nearby city that was drivable. Um, and then get up next morning, find a gym, um, get over to the arena. They start going through their stuff about three o'clock. And then, um, we're out of there one or two in the morning, back to the hotels and all that stuff. But Dwayne and I got to be friends. He was, he was on the verge of exploding, hadn't started all the movie stuff, but, uh, got to be friends with, uh, him and just, man, you talking about an entertaining guy. You, you could see it. He was the, the king of networking. We, we'd fly into Austin. He'd be like, who, who you know, who's. Who's Jim? I'm like Jeff Madden, Texas. We can work out there and that dog would, you know, roll out the red carpet for us. Let us meet everybody. And once you introduced uh, the rock to somebody, it was then his contact. So mm -hmm. he, uh, he networked your system and network is one of those things I, I learned watching him go through things. He I remember being in Tallahassee one night. He said, Hey, call this number. It's Ruth, Chris, get us a, a table. And I'm like, they'll be closed when we're done midnight. He's like, no, nah, now nah, call them and tell them that it's me. And we're bringing coach Bowden for dinner after the, after the main or after the event. Sure enough, they stay open just to, to treat, you know, to have those guys for dinner. And it's just all the networking and magic that he made happen. Uh, just a funny, good, good dude. One of my favorite stories about him that, that I tell is uh, we're 
our deal was that Dwayne would book the hotels and I would uh, book the cars. So we get to Baltimore, the Monday, the SmackDown or Raw show first down and uh, get there and they're having a snowstorm. And I'd always book us a Lincoln town car or some big suburban or something. And I get there and the guy at the rental car place is like, we don't have anything. There's, there's a blizzard coming. The only thing we have is a Toyota Corolla. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, long as short, we get to the arena and Dwayne's there and he's like, uh, Hey, they're canceling the event. I said, you got our hotel booked. He said, man, I didn't book us anything. He said, we'll find something. So by the time we pull out, I pull around, he comes around the parking garage and sees I'm in a Corolla. And he's like, you gotta be kidding me. And he's got all this Versace stuff on it. And gets in. We know more make it out of the parking garage and snow, you know, a foot deep. We make it two yards, maybe spinning. And he's looking at me, ready to cuss me up and down, just mad that I got this piece of junk to get us to the hotel. And uh, he, all these kids are swarmed around the parking garage, even with all this snow, trying to see these guys. And uh, he kind of cracks the window down and says, push the people's car to the Four Seasons, which was about three blocks away. And all these group of kids pushed us all the way to the Four Seasons. I'm like, we don't have a reservation here. He's like, you just bring the kids in and get, get them ready. And I'll sign some stuff in our bags. He said, we'll have a room. And of course we end up saying the presidential suite, um, uh, and everything was supposedly booked. That's just the kind of magic he, he had, uh, yeah. just one of those guys that made it happen wherever he was at. Oh, those, I know you could go on and on and on about those stories. But you know, one, of the things, one of the things I heard that you say, you were the medical dental person for the, for the, uh, for the organization, but I also heard you say that you're, you were part of the detail, the security detail. Oh yeah. For the wrestlers. Are y'all, y'all get, y'all picking this up? Well, many? you can look at that picture. Jim, Jim was a, a very, very big man. And most, most of those guys, it was like, you know, we were always taught at Mayor Bulls. It, it doesn't have to be physical. You can talk your way out of anything. And most mm -hmm. of the time it's just liaison stuff. Uh, I remember Rocky was in Nashville one time. I wanted to go to Tootsie's. I'm like, man, you'll get swarmed at Tootsie's. Wait, tell them who Rocky is. The Rock, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we go into Tootsie's and there's a band playing called Shit Eat and Grin. <laughs> and I'm like, what, what are we listening to this for? And he really gets into it. It's like, hey, I want to meet the guy playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. Ends up meeting him. I said, well, what would you do there? He said, I'm coming back to Nashville. Take, I wanted to learn how to play the guitar. So I, I'm going to fly back to Nashville to do it. I'm like, Dwayne, why don't you just find somebody in Miami where you live and make it easy on yourself. He's like, no, no, I, I like that guy. He flew back and forth on days off just to learn from uh, that guy and learn how to play the guitar. If the guy wanted to pick something up, he picked it up, mm. you know, flip the rearview mirror down and start saying his things, jabroni or, you know, whatever it was, be like, what was that sound? I was like, that's stupid, man. Nobody's going to get with that. And of course, everything he would say would end up being a t-shirt and he never mm -hmm. listened to me when they made any money, but uh, he, uh, he, he obviously has skyrocketed. Mm. Jody, those are some awesome stories. I want to welcome Gary Clark. Jim Arnold says to tell you hello. Hey, Jim, he's another one of those icons you look to in back in the day, Witt and Ken Hammond and all those guys. Absolutely. Kenny Cole is with us. Hey, Kenny, good to see you. Billy Smith is with us. Billy Keystone Smith. in the house. All right. We got a few more minutes here, Jody. I want to ask you, I've had the privilege of – being a business partner with my youngest brother for 20 years. You and Dwayne have been buddies. Well, you've been brothers. You've been business partners for, for many years. And you, you shared some of the early stories about being in school together, being in practice together. How is that dynamics with two brothers in practice together? And how often did Mama Lucy had to step in to mediate things when they got a little sideways between you <laughs> you know I, I can't tell you any times really that Dwayne and I've been cross on anything you know my brother as well as anybody he's just he's a soft-spoken good guy one of the smartest guys walking uh business-wise when I got back from WWE I said Dr. Mack that I'd mentioned had passed away I said it's time to put one downtown and you know Dwayne's like Let, let's go for it and I'm like well we'll be another seven figures in the hole and he's like Let, let's go just go do it if you think that's what we need to do and uh, went and did it. And the, you, you had asked earlier about the leading in that, that helped Dwayne and I was, cause every time the wrestling WWE was in town, even to this day, you know, guys stop by and have work done or call saying they need to come in, uh, or quite a few of them actually live here now. So that kind of networked into entertainers being on music row with, and that whole genre. So 
he's he's been my partner through through the whole thing. We had the hockey team for seven years, and that was a deal where you know Dwayne would cover, I would cover, whoever need be. There's you know, 44 nights you're sitting down there on a zero to zero game on a Tuesday night, freezing your you know what off and. Uh, it was good to have somebody to split that up with and divide it because a lot of this stuff you just couldn't do night after night by yourself. Yeah, no, I and having somebody who you trust, who you love, and who who you know is your other half, if you will. Yeah, that's 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 so invaluable. I, I'm blessed to have that with my my youngest brother in business, Jody. I want to talk about you brought up Ashton a couple of times. At what point did Ashton's father realize? it's time to quit coaching Ashton and let the guys who are getting paid to do this. And maybe I'll just step back into that dad support role or have you gotten there yet? Yeah, no, I've been there, you know, with the training stuff with uh, Chris and doc and all that mindset back in the day, it was, you know, lift heavy and I've had to rely on other guys that kept up with the times and kind of step back. And like I said, uh, mad dogs, one of those guys I call and ask questions and we went to visit Jeff in Texas and, Ashton's had great exposure to all those guys, but yeah. And just like sending him to Jeff, Jeff said, that's where he needed to play. And, you know, I, I didn't have to go tell our coach, Hey, Jeff says he's a running back. That's where he ends up. And uh, so, so Jeff obviously knows what he's doing too. And to have those friends around lead your kids, it means a lot more. Uh, one of my teammates, Josie, Brian Josie told me with his son, Noah, he's like, man, it was fun playing. He said, but when it's your kid playing, he said, it, it takes it to a whole nother level, whether it's your son, your daughter, you know, it's, I heard it, Pat uh, Akis on here talking about his daughters the other night. And it's, it's true. I mean, it, it's bigger than what's going on with, with you, you know, I, to look at a highlight film of anything I did in high school versus my sons. Now it's like, I don't, I just take it out. There's, there's no comparison. What level were your nerves back in December before the state title game? You know, pretty good, but uh I, I was worried because you, you never know with Jeff. He, we'd played him earlier in the season and just barely won seven to three. And uh, he had a good club. So you just didn't know. And I've told him time and time again, we, we got to go twice when I was there. Uh, and the second team was better than the first team, but the second team didn't win it because we had an injury that, that cost us. And I told him, you, you don't know, even you got two more years, but you don't know if you'll be back. So enjoy every minute of it and, and eat it up because it, it may be the last time you get to be here. So. Well, and, and did that sink in? I'm, I'm sure it did with Ashton, but how did it, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to get into his mindset. I've never met him, of course, but knowing who was coaching the other side and that relationship with the family and him personally, did that have any mental impact with him before the game? Certainly did after the game, but what about before the game? Yeah, you know, Jeff's obviously he, he's one of the classiest people I've ever met. He took time. I noticed uh, before the game started to find me, Brad, uh, there was probably nine, 10 former Vandy guys there to see mm -hmm. Brad's son play my son, Jeff coach. And, uh, you know, Luke and, and all those guys, Kenny Pruss. Uh, oh, Kenny. Kenny was there. There was a, a big group. We got a, there's a photo on my uh, Facebook. That's got us all there. Of course, both the gains is, uh, and uh, all those guys had come into town to watch and just it, it was it was great atmosphere through the through the whole thing. But Ashton's one of those that uh, our school got hit by the tornado back mm -hmm. way back when. And I'd taken Ashton to camps every summer, seventh and eighth grade to Innsworth and MBA. And he's like, why do you keep taking me to these schools that you say I'm not going to go to because I'm going to end up back at DCA? And I said, we well, just need experience all the coaching you can get. I mean, MBA coach Sanders, Chris Sanders played for the Titans. I said, just get all that you can get. Why can't I go to one of those schools? I was like, you didn't grow up with those kids. You grew up with these kids. And uh, after the tornado, I said, hey, man, he was getting ready to start his freshman year. I said, it's going to be two years before the school's back to where it should be. I said, so if you want to make the move, I I'll let you pick if you want to go to one of those. He's like, nah, I grew up with these kids. So it meant a lot this year. Oh, good kid. Good kid. And, of course, Rock Batten's doing some great stuff at Ensworth. Yeah, Rock's got to go on, too. Jody, I could talk to you forever, bud, but I know we got other things we got to we got to get to. But thank you for taking us on your journey and sharing some phenomenal Bernard, stories tonight. Thanks for bringing us all together. I mean, it's fun for me to watch guys that I, I don't, you know, get to keep up with because we're all busy with life. And uh, here, I think a week or two ago, you were mentioning about Bobby Craycraft's son getting to go to Duke and Henry yeah. Bielen's son. I mean, that, that that's that's great. Rico Francis, I know his son is at uh, Wake Forest or was at Wake Forest graduating. Uh, 
just great players. Shelton's son, I think, is at UAB and or or at Sanford. I'm sorry, Sanford and Birmingham. But uh, yeah. just it's only way to keep up with guys is to watch and yeah. see what's going on. And Larry Smith is coach, coaching wide receivers at UAB. So there's there's some connections everywhere. For sure, for sure. Uh, thank you, thank you, Jody. I really, really have enjoyed it tonight. Thanks, Bernard. Appreciate you, and uh, glad glad our dog's still do, doing his thing, man. Yeah, she's. Uh, she, I can see her right over here. She's she's, she's doing her thing. But guys, keep coming back. Go look in the Facebook group. You'll recognize a whole bunch of legendary Commodores in there over the next couple of months. Every Tuesday night, all the way. I got them scheduled all the way up to Hawaii Game Week. Y'all continue to do what's right for your families. Be safe. Y'all continue to anchor down. Have a good night. Thanks, Bernard.